Thanks for coming this evening. Now you Thanks should for be, having me. You should be used to the weather though, living in New Orleans, right? Yeah, yeah, I've been down there for about 16 years now. It's a wonderful town, which I had the pleasure of uh, visiting for the first time this year, and I really loved it. It was really a, a fantastic. Place. Yeah, food, music, it's got it all. What was it that drew you to Searing it? heat during the summer. <laughs> uh, I used to go down there just to get lost when I'd, I'd get a couple of nickels to rub together. Uh, I just, it, it's nothing like it. And I, I'd just uh, go down there for adventures, a few of which I remember. Um, but, and uh, I, I married a beautiful girl from Louisiana, and when we decided to blow out of California with a pack of dogs chasing us, we, uh, we, we settled there. It was, she could be close to her family while I went out and worked. And of course, you've been, uh, you had worked on the first season of Treme for HBO, which was a wonderful show set in New Orleans. Yeah, it was, I, I was provided an opportunity to vent uh, the frustrations that a lot of people felt about the lack of uh, help in the recovery down there. What was it like actually being there during that whole period? I mean, the immediate aftermath of the hurricane. I booked a play in Los Angeles, and I was leaving that day, or the, the day before the storm hit. Um, my wife went to her, her, her mother's uh, 60 miles north of of New Orleans, they thought they'd be safe there, and that I didn't hear from them for a few days. Uh, but I was up in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, just watching things. But uh, we were moving uh, that weekend, so uh, neither neither house that we, the neither the house that we were moving into, nor the old house got hit. But uh, it, was, it was just devastating for everyone. Even this year, I noticed, uh, you know, some years later now, that you still see the areas of devastation. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it's still there, but I, I must say that the city has rebounded tremendously. You've been doing a lot of charity work, I know, down there. I don't know whether you talk about it very much, but it's, it's gratifying to see that, you've, that you really are putting something back into a well, city it's, that you love. It's, I've, I've got so much pleasure from the city over the years. Did you feel that Treme was uh, was an accurate portrayal of the city? Yeah, it's it's the most accurate uh, portrayal I've seen. Uh, usually, it's uh, people with straw hats and armbands playing uh, Dixieland um, and too much Mardi Gras stuff. But uh, it, it's it's pretty accurate. I, I, the thing that was most gratifying about it was the profile that it gave to these great New Orleans music, musicians, uh, young and old. Uh, people that have been around for years that you don't know their faces, but it, and it was it was lovely to see that. It, it uh, they in a lot of ways define that city. Let's talk a little bit about where you where you actually grew up. You're from St. Louis. Yes, yeah, St. Louis, Missouri, home of Anheuser Busch, St. Louis Cardinals. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> When did you uh, develop your passion for acting? Were, 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 was anyone in your family in the business? No. <laughs> no. Uh, my mother was very dramatic. <laughs> uh, I used to do imitations of people. Uh, and I I've, I've found that it served me well to get out of beatings. From uh, from bigger people, and uh, it, 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 I just saw how much it uh, people liked it, and uh, I like kind of being the center of attention. I guess I did a couple of musicals in high school. I went to a junior college for a year. I, I got into the theater part department there late. Uh, wound up doing three plays in a row. I transferred down to a, a state school, and I found a, a very good teacher. Uh, I wasted a lot of time in a fraternity. I had a good time for a while till I ran out of money and they bounced me. Then after, after I got famous, they wanted me back. And I went like a dog. Yeah, you, had, you, you were an athlete too, right? You played football. Yeah, we played football. Our team won one game in four years. They weren't beating down the door trying to find me. <clears throat> I went uh, uh, to this college, pardon my voice, by the way, 
I went to a, a school in Springfield, Missouri, to try to walk on the football team, which means without a scholarship, you just try out, you audition for the football team. And I never even got to do that because my grades were so lousy. And I, I stuck around, I did a one-act play the next spring, and it caught the attention of my, my drama teacher. Um, who the next few years pounded a lot of Stanislavski and common sense into my head. He was a, he was a, a good man. He'd been around community theaters most of his life. He went to Yale drama. Uh, he was a, a D-Day veteran. Yeah, he, he just opened a lot of doors for me and made me see new way to, ways to read things, break down scenes. Um, and it, it, it just, I found a passion that I didn't know that I had. When you, I suppose um, it, it's fair to say that when Roseanne exploded on the scene that that sort of propelled you forward. Is that what she did? <laughs> I think she did. There was an eruption. Roseanne explodes. <laughs> there were several eruptions. When that uh, sort of unfolded as a phenomenon, though, and you were a, you know, suddenly uh, a well-known face as a comic actor, had you thought of yourself as a comic actor, or had you thought of yourself as an all-round I, I preferred doing comedy because the the results are immediate. People laugh, or not. <laughs> uh, but but you know if you're being effective or not. It it just it sharpens your tools. What was it about Roseanne? Do you think that made it a phenomenon? What was it about that show that suddenly was so popular? I think at the, at the time there were a lot of uh, shows on about very rich, very good-looking people. And we were neither. Uh, a lot of, uh, most of the people that I knew said that, oh yeah, this is my family. Um, we were highly dysfunctional. Not, you know, not unlike the family that we had at the show itself. But in a great way. Every family is dysfunctional in some way or another. It sort of caught the, I uh, hate to use a word like zeitgeist, but it was sort of, the times, you know, when people... Oh, yeah, were, absolutely. You know. It was the right show for the right, at the right time. A lot of people were uh, struggling at the time. So, yeah, I think we captured something there. And, we, you know, we, we weren't pretty people in our own ways. But uh, a, a lot of people could identify with us. You had real um, rapport, it seemed, with Roseanne. I mean, you really seemed like a, like a couple. When I walked into the audition, it... We just hit it off right away. I, th I think I walked in and saw her sitting on a sofa and said, move over. I never met her before. <laughs> and, you know, we just uh, read a few things and, and just laughed. We, we just enjoyed. It was, you know, it was one of the best auditions I'd ever had. And I, I came out of there, <clears throat> uh, not like an ego thing, but I just knew I had it. I knew I had the job. I was right for once. Nine years that show ran, right? Yeah. Um, I actually kind of burned out after about five or six. Um, what do you do, um, if I may ask, in, in a case like that, what do you do as an actor to keep yourself interested, to keep yourself going, or do you feel like walking? No, I, uh, I didn't feel like walking. It, it was just... Uh, I think it went on too long, but, uh, you know, I'm, I was probably wrong. But it... Uh, no, there, there was enough interest there and enough. It was like going to a, a, a family every day, uh, going to work. and uh, There's something about that that I've never been able to recapture uh, that, that I, I really miss. Um, but I, I, I just think I was, uh, I was looking to, to get out and do something else. But, you know, it, it, it ran and uh, it worked. It's another association that you had around the same time yeah. you had developed in '87 with Raising Arizona as your long-standing relationship with the Cohen. Brothers. Yeah, that was that was uh, in 1985. That that was probably the best audition I ever had, and I didn't even care if I got the job. I was having, I I just walked in, and we we just caught up for for an hour uh, during those auditions. I think I was goofing on people's resume pictures, and they were laughing along, uh, just nervous energy, but uh, I, I thought I'd found kindred spirits because the script was so damn good. And uh, it's, it's, 
It's been a blessing to me over the years working with uh, Joel and Ethan. This, uh, the new film that you have out right now, Inside Lewin Davis, is, I believe, the fifth time that you've worked with them. Yeah, they know exactly what they want, uh, which is refreshing. And it's always, what they want is always very good. And they're, they're great storytellers. And it's always a little different, always a little unexpected. Is everything tightly scripted, or do you have an opportunity to uh, extemporize a bit? The only time in the years that I've, I've ever, all the years that I've worked with them, the only time I remember something being not scripted was when Jeff Bridges called the Big Lebowski a human paraquat. <laughs> that was Jeff's invention. But, yeah, it, I'm constantly asked about the Big Lebowski. Uh, we, we had the luxury of two weeks of rehearsal uh, reading, and it finally got to the point where it looked like it could have been improvised. Is there any truth to the rumor that the character that you play in The Big Lebowski is sort of based on John Milius? He's based on uh, three guys, and one of them is John Milius. Who are the other two? I don't remember. <laughs> I, I, I really don't. It, it, uh, they're uh, people who don't have John Milius' fame or firearms. <laughs> He himself uh, has perpetuated that story quite a bit over Well, the then I'm not going to be the one to argue with him. I, no, I, I, that was one of the, the people Joel, Joel told me about, yeah. What is it that the Cohen brothers, do you think, see in you uh, as an actor? What is it that you specifically bring? I don't, it, it could be as simple as saying I get them. I don't ask a lot of questions. I work cheap. Uh, we both have Midwestern sensibilities, they remind me of wise guys that I grew up with that would read Mad Magazine and crack wise in school, get in trouble. They're a lot smarter than I am. Uh, but I, I understand a lot of their references. Inside Lewin Davis is a very idiosyncratic film, even by their standards, I think. To me, it's about success. Uh, it, it hit me, uh, I've seen it three times, it's hit me three different ways. Uh, the second time, it very powerful about the Lewin's success and fear, fear or fear of success. Is it anti-success? What, what, and how much of your soul do you give away? <laughs> and how much is just being obstinate? Um, but I think he obviously hates what he sees around him that's successful. Uh, I, I think Lewis, Lewin's going to wind up doing well somewhere. I think today he owns a theater in Branson, Missouri. Where's a straw hat and arm garters? <laughs> Lewin Davis's good time, fun folk theater. Where's your character? Oh, he's long gone. <laughs> he's running a rehab clinic in Venice. <laughs> you say that you've been extremely busy lately? Yeah. <laughs> to the point where I'm, I, miss a lot, I miss home a lot. I mean, I, I, I'm not going to whine about it. I love, I love to work. Uh, last year I was in uh, Babelsberg, Germany, and in England, briefly, uh, for George Clooney's movie. Uh, then I went to New York uh, right after that to do a television show for Amazon.com called Alpha House, playing a senator from North Carolina. Thank you, computer owners. <laughs> First three shows are free. Well, we wanted to ask you a bit about that. That's a show that um, I think was, uh, is it Gary Trudeau? Gary Trudeau. Trudeau. And, and the Jonathan Doonesbury Alter, fame. And Jonathan Alter, the, uh, the, the Newsweek uh, political correspondent. Yeah, John Alter, the author and, and uh, old news, late lamented Newsweek magazine correspondent. Uh, provides a, a lot of insight into what goes on in the Washington, a lot of the backstory. <laughs> keeps things real, and Gary's just Gary. But Gary plugs away and, and turns out what I think are these really funny scripts every week. So, I mean, uh, tell us a bit about that show, because the audience uh, hopefully it's will go to their computers and watch it. Four senators who share a townhouse in Washington to cut down on expenses while they're in town, and hilarity ensues. Uh, the, the most important things that the, the politicians do, apparently is keep running, is to get reelected. That's their job. And they're facing challenges now from uh, 
mostly from the far right. And it's how far, again, how, how much of your soul do you give up to keep your job? My particular character is a retired basketball coach, and I think he's viewing this job as a great retirement job. He likes perks. He likes helicopter rides to football games, uh, limousines, uh, going on to the odd talk show. He just uh, he revels in it. And now he's being challenged by another basketball coach who's with more pronounced right-wing views. So he's trying to placate the, the, uh, the far right wing. How many, how many episodes will there be in the first Eleven. season? Eleven. Shot the pilot in February and... We just wrapped a couple of weeks ago. You mentioned that uh, new George Clooney film, The Monuments Men. Tell us a bit about that one. It's based on a true story. Written uh, The book is called The Monuments Men by Robert Edsel, a historian. It tells a story I, di- I didn't know anything about. Uh, a curator from a museum in Har- uh, at Harvard, uh, this goes to Truman and, and tries to put together a bunch of sculptors, artists, to try to g- gather as much information on looted Nazi art, to track it down right after Normandy when, when the troops were moving east. They were shortly behind them trying to track down and preserve monuments and, and the art that was looted, sculptors, or sculptures, uh, Try to keep things from getting blown up again, uh, like they did at Monte Cassino in in, in Italy. That that's what prompted it, the destruction of that monastery. And uh, so George and his partner wrote a screenplay, yeah. and we shot it at Babelsberg in uh, in Rye, England. Um, the beach down there was substituted for Normandy, um, and around London. George Clooney is becoming quite the producer, and of course you'd had great success uh, the previous year with Argo, of course. Yeah, he's he's a great storyteller. He, w- I, he I always knew that kid had something. He was on the first year of Roseanne. He had a lot more hair. <laughs> Wild mane. Uh, and wow, God, he was the life of the party. But he, there was something beyond that. He's, he's a very smart guy. Um, and he's got a huge, big heart. Uh, but he's a great storyteller. He knows how to get around the BS, uh, pare things down. He doesn't waste any time. But there's a, a spirit that permeates uh, from the production direction on down. And uh, it, it's, it's just probably the most fun I've ever had on a film. Um, just gr- a great atmosphere on this set. And that's, that's, that's George. Let's see if our audience has any questions for you. Anyone like to uh, ask? Wake them up. Yep. Yes. Okay, I'm always curious about the moment. So you were doing community theaters in Missouri. So how did you get from there to Roseanne? I went to college. I went to New York. Um, and did you get discovered by a... a a big time agent that had some no, power. No, uh, one got of the one or? of the casting agents for uh, the Carsey Warner Company saw me in a production of Anthony and Cleopatra at Los Angeles Theater Center. And then they called really, you in. Tony to Richardson meet? directed it. He put sand on the stage, <laughs> <laughs> and every night the, the first few rows of the audience were. <laughs> It was interesting. Now, are you going to produce in future? <laughs> I'm too lazy. <laughs> I'm too damn lazy. I, I, I just don't have a produ- production bone in me. I did once. Uh, <clears throat> there was a television show, a, a television production about Yui Long uh, called Kingfish in the early 90s, and, and TNT was doing a bunch of these where they offered people uh, producerships participate so I, I said yeah I'll be I'll be a producer well, all right and then they hired guys to actually produce it and then they'd ask me well, what about this actor I go, oh, he's good okay 
I, I, I just, I just don't have it in me. Uh, John, I'm an old friend of Bill Forsyth. We studied together and did two films together. You guys looked like you had a great time on Raising Arizona. Were you allowed to go really big on that? Uh, you looked like you really had fun. We couldn't get big enough. <laughs> Bill Forsyth and I, 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 I thought, yeah, I, I give a great audition, and I'm, I'm a swell guy and a great actor. They, I found out later they hired Bill Forsyth and I because we had baby faces, and that was the whole theme of the movie. So uh, thank God for that. Yeah, Bill was great. We, we, yeah, we tried to out-scream each other. Hi. I work um, with Chuck Lorre on Big Bang Theory. And uh, I just wondered if you had, and Johnny Galecki, obviously, I wondered if you still maintained relationships with any of the people from Roseanne and if you had any plans to return to multicam sitcom work. Well, I'm doing a sitcom now. Uh, well, Roseanne and I did a pilot... Uh, it's going on a couple of years now for NBC, and they decided to pass on it. But we had a we had a wonderful time. Yeah, I see Chuck every once in a while. So good. Um, I wanted to microphone. ask you about uh, Treme, character that you uh, and you and Chase uh, created. It was so powerful, and what the message was, you know, about uh, the anger against the non-reaction to Katrina. To take your character out at the end of the first season, I mean, is that a, was that a deliberate choice? Were you part of that decision? Or? No, no, that was uh, just that when I, they came to New York, uh, I, I was working up there, and we met David Simon, and I, uh, and David told me the story of the character, and he was going to uh, go ahead and knock him off after the first season. Uh, uh, that was t totally agreeable. Because it was based on a man that did that, a suicide. But I, I just want a, I wanted to work at home, and B, I wanted to be part of the story, uh, because from what I read, it, it was unique in its description of New Orleans and its citizens, and it had something to say about Katrina and uh, the faulty levee system of the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, yes. I want to talk about your hairdo in Llewellyn, in Lewin Davis. Yes. Ask away. <laughs> How was that constructed? <laughs> By combing my hair down. It was, uh, it, it was totally my fault. I, I just wanted the hair, my hair to look like uh, the great baritone saxophone player, saxophone player Jerry Mulligan. Combed his hair down like that. Mine was a little more like Mo Howard, <laughs> but it was uh, it was just I th think one more way that my character could piss off the man. Just uh, yeah, he didn't fit into society, so just one more thing to piss people off. What did he do, your character, in Inside Lewin Davis? <clears throat> what do you think his main occupation is? He's a he's a good pianist, or he wouldn't be going to the Gate of Horn to play. Uh, I'm sure he does that from city to city. They they used to go and uh, I fancied him a, a piano player. And after we rapped, Joel said, "No, he's a trumpet player," and he thought he was a sax player. <laughs> but I I just I thought he was a piano player. You know, riding around in the back of a car, going from city to city. Uh, getting like a pickup bass and drummer. And uh, that's how he made his living. But I, I think he was a very good musician, just a very bad person. Although he does end up getting left uh, in a car abandoned. Yeah, like the cat. <laughs> <laughs> hey, John, uh, I just wanted to talk about baseball. And you, you made The Babe 20 years ago. I read that you um, wanted to go back to it because you didn't feel you did yourself justice. I wondered how much, how galling was it to play a Yankee as opposed to you're a passionate St. Louis Cardinals fan? It was a great privilege to play Babe Ruth. Uh, it, it's, after I saw the film, I wanted to go back, oh, I want to do this again, I want to get it right. I, 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 I wasn't pleased with my performance in it. There was, <laughs> I uh, just didn't get enough time with the athletic stuff. You know, we, we got it, I started six months before shooting, I, I, Throw left-handed every day. Then we got guys 
uh, professionals to come in and help me swing and pitch left-handed. And we, it got pretty good. And then when we got to Chicago to shoot, the baseball stuff wasn't for another month. And we were, you know, shooting pretty long days, so I didn't, I didn't get a chance. Only every once in a while did I get a chance to, to try to keep up with the the hitting and, and the throwing. And after the whole thing was over, I finally saw a picture of Babe Ruth pitching, and he pitched sidearm, which is a whole different way than I learned. But yeah, it, 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 I just wanted it to be better. But I ate a lot of hot dogs and smoked a lot of cigars. Is there um, a role that you would love to tackle that you've never tackled, or maybe even to give your spin on an already existing performance? I uh, know and no. I just I don't think that far ahead. <laughs> I'd like to get back on stage at some point. I think I'm going to require knee surgery before that happens. Um, yeah, I got... I got this one fixed, and this one needs to be fixed. So, but it, yeah, it, it that it, that would help a lot more. But I, I I would like to do a lot more stage work. I really enjoy it. Well, thank you. Thank you. As a writer, I, I was interested. Do you read through a lot of scripts to choose your parts, or do you sort of trust in the relationships that you formed and and sort of go from those? The script comes first. Uh, well, it depends on the director, but I, I uh, usually the, the, the script, uh, I'm in a position now where I, I can, if, if I'm offered something, I, I, I prefer not to do it if the script isn't good, because then it takes too much time to try to fix it while you're doing it, or uh, <clears throat> get another rewrite or another guy in, it just, Saves a lot of time. It just speaks to me immediately if the script is good. And then the director and then uh, fellow cast members. That's the order. Do you read a lot of scripts weekly, yes. monthly? I have them read to me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, I read them. Can you, uh, you mentioned that you wanted to get back to stage. Can you talk a little bit about your musical theater career and if musicals are something you might want to get back to? I started out doing musicals. Uh, I would, in New York, <clears throat> the dinner theaters around the country would hold their auditions in New York, and uh, I started out by going out of town. I got my union card uh, doing that. Uh, I always had a very limited range. Uh, I got lucky and, and went to Broadway with a musical that, I, that was developed at the La Jolla Playhouse that didn't really require a pretty voice. But I, I always had a pretty good bass for harmonies and stuff like that. And uh, my favorite musical was called The Robber Bridegroom that I did the national tour of, and we did it at Ford's Theater, Washington. Uh, but the, uh, that was uh, country, old-timey, bluegrassy type of thing. Um, but for a straight musical, I, I think I'm cooked there. And I haven't been on stage for about five years now. What was the last thing you did on stage? Waiting for Gatto on, at, uh, on Broadway for the Roundabout Theater. Nathan Lane and Bill Irwin. When you, when you have completed a role, do you actually watch your performance? <laughs> uh, not for a while. Well, it depends if, if, if they make me go to premieres and stuff. I'll put my head down when I'm on. I, I just to get uncomfortable. I just see microbes up there, little tiny mistakes that I've made or, or wish I could do over. Uh, there's sometimes when I can just enjoy it. Are you the type of actor who does sort of relitigate what you've done, or do you, once having done it, you just let it go? I, I let it go now. But early on, I just, you, you, yeah, it used to drive me nuts. I, I, I still... I, I, for some reason, I, I don't watch Roseanne anymore. Or I, I never really did. I, I just thought we had so much fun doing it that I didn't need to see it again. And um, I just haven't watched it for a long time. I, I might start doing that. It would be very interesting, I'm sure, to 
to revisit something after such a period of time. Yeah, it, it, I might might do that. Yeah, see what happens. <laughs> well, it costs nothing. <laughs> yes, in the corner. Oh, hey, John, you referred to uh, when you were first starting out as an actor with that teacher in uh, the Midwest, uh, learning a particular way of breaking down and working on a script. I wondered if you'd maybe uh, enlarge on that a little bit. And, uh, and if you, you did it in reference to my favorite of your performances of the Coen Brothers and Barton Fink, I would, I would love to hear you talk about that part in that role. You know, he was obviously mad as a snake, just crazy. But he just looked like the hail fellow well met from next door. So I think he just wanted to be friends with Bart. <laughs> <laughs> and kill people. Well, other people. Not Bart. You like Barton. Except Barton didn't listen. But he let Bart live. Yes. And I think that's friendship. <laughs> that's what friends do. They let each other live. Hey, John. Uh, just did you have an experience that you could remember what was the difference working with British crews to working with American crews? I, the first time I was in England was in 1990. The summer, I did a film called King Ralph at Pinewood with a great British crew. The first AD was named Derek Cracknell. Wonderful man to me. Uh, but he, he was very well regarded by a lot of people. Uh, I saw the second AD a couple of, day, uh, a couple of weeks ago in New York, oddly enough. Um, Are they different to Americans? They require more tea breaks, don't they? they? Require more tea breaks. They were all no, because they were all so damn good. Uh, it, it was uh, yeah, they were proud of their craft and and and. Uh, you know, plugged along daily like like everybody does. It, yeah, it was a good crew. I, I, I didn't notice any difference. But, oh, my God, I loved working with Peter O'Toole. We, we had a lovely time. Uh, we'd, we'd have poker games with Richard Griffiths, John Hurt, Peter, Jimmy Villers, and uh, the, for the second AD would come to fetch us after lunch, and I'd... Oh, yes, uh, yes, sir, I'm, I'm ready to go. And Peter would still be in his dressing ground, down just lounging, and I'd get up, and I'm ready to go. Yeah, I'll be right there. And he'd go, Peter, I'd look down, and Peter's leering at me. You have no style. <laughs> so I shrunk back down into my seat and <laughs> waited for his permission to leave. <laughs> Is that something, like, do you enjoy that at all, or is it just bizarre to you, or, or what, what's that like? Well, it's always bizarre to me, but I, I, I enjoy it because I enjoy the movie so much, and I, I had so much fun making it, that, and I feel proud to be a part of that. And I, I don't mind at all when, when people approach me on the street. Um, Screaming lines at you? Yeah, it, it happens. <laughs> uh, it yeah, I, I, because we're, we're all fans. I'm a big fan of the film, too. Have you seen any of the stuff on the internet where they take the, the Walter Sobchak face and put it in different movies? And... No. <laughs> uh, that, uh, that's a little too far. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. I don't care. There is too much stuff on the internet. I just, I'm old. I don't get it. At this point in your life and career, John, are you pretty happy with the way things have gone? I'm very grateful for the way things have gone. <coughs> uh, I wasn't always that grateful. I, I don't know whether I... Exp I got a lot real fast when Roseanne happened. Um, you know, I think I got a little big-headed. Uh, I was working very hard. I didn't think I was ever entitled, but it just uh, I, I lost a little gratitude along the way. Um, and the older I get, the more grateful I, I am that uh, things have worked out as well as they have. 
because I never in a million years thought I'd be doing something like this. It's <laughs> lovely that all you folks came here tonight. And, uh, yeah, I'm very happy the way things turned out. I hope it's not over. <laughs> you guys know something? <laughs> what's, oh, well. what's left to do? What's Puppet shows. Do? Yeah? I don't know. I'm. I haven't. I, I'm not really thinking um, too much. It's just whatever happens next, uh, and try to do the best I can. Well, whatever it is, John, we will be with you every step of the way. Thanks for joining us. Thank tonight. you very much. Thank you for your time. Thanks for coming tonight. You've been lovely. Thank you very much. <laughs>